all living things share features. Uh, they share aspects of cells, they share genes, um, and so therefore they are considered to be related and having inherited these from a common ancestor. Um, but yeast and humans are eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are a subset of living things which share even more features that bacteria lack. And so eukaryotes share a common ancestor which came after uh, the uh, common ancestor of all living things. Um, by uh, 700 million years ago or so, there were animals on Earth for the first time. And all animals share features which evolved in the earliest animals and sponges uh, and humans are descended from those ancestral animals. But by 600 and some million years ago, there was a new group, the metazoans, which would include things like uh, jellyfish, corals, hydra, sea pens, um, and uh, humans uh, uh, that obviously are diverse, um, but which share features. So for example, they share tissues. Um, not only just the fact that they have tissues, unlike sponges or placozoans, that's a very simple type of, of, of microscopic animal. Um, they then also have tissues known as endoderm and ectoderm. Um, so uh, both humans and cnidarians um, have this tissue layer, ectoderm, which will form their outer epidermis. Uh, and in humans, it also composes the nervous uh, system. Um, in, uh, there is a tissue known as endoderm, which could, uh, in both uh, forms the cells which line uh, the gut, in humans lines the lungs. Uh, now, one of the ways that there can be uh, these tissues is because these uh, metazoan animals amplify the number of genes for transcription factors. Um, see, it's one thing to have a gene, it's another thing to regulate its use. And if you're going to start having different cells, as we humans do, um, that means you need some cells for the brain cells to express, I'm, I'm sorry, some genes for the brain cells to express, some genes for the um, gut cells to express, etc. And the way that you regulate that is by having proteins called transcription factors, uh, which bind uh, uh, the DNA of specific genes and help activate them and so that you can regulate which genes are on and off. And so then, you know, ectoderm can express different genes from endoderm and thus be different. And so metazoan animals evolved more of these uh, genetic mechanisms for differentiation. Uh, and so we see more specialization of cells in these um, uh, in uh, metazoan animals. Now, not only do we see tissues, but we see some of the same tissues, like endoderm lining the gut, ectoderm forming the uh, epidermis, um, but also then nervous tissue and muscle tissue. Now, I'm not saying, you know, jellyfish, well, they kind of sort of have something that kind of sort of rem reminds us of nervous tissue in humans. No, they have nervous tissue made of neurons, uh, which are conducting electricity uh, using the same ion uh, channels, uh, which are signaling muscle cells using neuropeptides homologous to those found in, uh, uh, in uh, humans. Um, uh, now, jellyfish, they obviously don't have a brain or a spinal cord. Uh, they instead have neurons forming a nerve net, kind of a decentralized plexus of neurons. But we humans do as well. So there, is a, there are plexuses of neurons, say, around the gastrovascular cavity of cnidarians regulating the secretion of digestive enzymes and their digestion. We humans in our GI tract um, have nerve nets, plexuses uh, of neurons which are regulating the secretion of digestive enzymes and the contraction of muscle along the GI tract. So even though we have a brain and spinal cord, to a large extent, it's not the brain and spinal cord which is running digestion. It is this decentralized nerve net of plexuses um, which is governing uh, digestion. Actually, the enteric nervous system of humans lining the gut um, has 10 times more neurons than the spinal cord does. Uh, so there are similarities. Uh, notice that these cnidarians can move because they actually have muscle. Once again, not muscle-like cells. No, these are actual muscle cells uh, with homologous proteins, mechanisms of action um, compared to the muscle cells of, uh, of humans. And so um, these metazoan animals, they have features uh, which sponges simply 
uh, lack. They do not have, um, as sponges don't have tissues, they don't have nerve cells, they don't have muscle, uh, they don't have ectoderm and endoderm. The endoderm doesn't line the gut, but these are features that the cnidarians share. Nidarians, um, I, I'm sorry, cnidarians share with humans to form the metazoans. Cnidarians uh, would then uh, be things like uh, jellyfish, corals, hydra, sea pens, sea fans, um, sea anemones, and others. Um, now, uh, because cnidarians have endoderm, uh, which can uh, compose the gut lining, the gastrodermis, and uh, ectoderm, uh, which forms the epidermis on the outside, um, they are called a diploblastic, where they have two tissue layers, as opposed to the bilaterians, the worms and humans, which are triploblastic, having three. Uh, and so there are two separate tissues here. There is an ectoderm, uh, which composes the outside, and an endoderm, which composes the inside lining, the gut cavity, say in this hydra. So this is a little cnidarian um, called a hydra. Separating the two, uh, the epidermis of ectoderm and the gastrodermis of endoderm can be an area of mesoglea, which can be very thin, say in this hydra, or uh, could uh, be much uh, thicker in, uh, in jellyfish. So once again, these um, cnidarians, uh, they have two of the three original tissue layers which are present in, uh, human, uh, in, in human embryos. One of the things that makes cnidarians a little hard to study is that they have different uh, stages of their life cycle and cnidarians can then differ. So if you look here at this hydra, this is what we call a polyp. It has a cylindrical body which attaches to uh, the uh, substrate. And then from the cylindrical body, then you have these tentacled arms with stinging cells called uh, cnidocytes, um, uh, uh, which I can then capture prey and bring them into uh, the mouth. We could, I'll talk about that in just a second. So this is a polyp. Now some organisms like hydra, this is really all they have. Polyp, you know, the polyp stage is you know, essentially their life uh, cycle other than the embryo before it attaches. Um, but then other cnidarians then have this medusa phase where it isn't a cylindrical body attached to uh, the substrate, uh, but ra rather this swimming uh, modal uh, form. Um, and some cnidarians have both. They then go through a polyp phase first, and then from the polyp then uh, uh, develops uh, the swimming uh, medusa phase. Uh, and so some cnidarians have just a polyp phase, some have a polyp followed by a medusa phase, and some just have a medusa phase. And so this obviously makes you know, their you know, study a little more difficult. Um, if uh, all they have is a polyp phase, then the polyp phase will undergo uh, sexual reproduction. So here you see in a hydra, in a cross section, notice that it has ovaries and uh, tester uh, and testes, making uh, ova and sperm. But if um, there is a medusa phase, that is the phase that has the uh, the gonads. Now, just a, a quick point on the gonads: um, all metazoan animals have gonads, while sponges lack them. Sponges can just kind of uh, form. Uh, sex cells anywhere in the body, whereas in uh, the metazoan animals, uh, only specialized regions of the body, known as gonads, will form ova. So ova uh, will form here in this ovary, but not here. This tissue is digesting um, uh, the food. This is the gastrodermis. This is the epidermis. So ovaries will form separate from here. You know, what, this area won't make ova nor here. And here you see uh, a separate region uh, forming um, forming sperm. So once again, the metazoan animals perform meiosis to produce sex cells, but only in specialized regions of the body. And this is different from what we see in the most uh, primitive uh, animals. Um, and so uh, here's an ovum, and here are the cells which are becoming sperm. Uh, now, once again, since hydra lack a medusa phase, then it is this polyp phase in hydra 
uh, which uh, forms uh, the ovaries and uh, testes and produces sex cells for sexual reproduction, and the gametes can be released into the surrounding water. However, in the um, uh, in the uh, cnidarians, which have a medusa phase, it is the medusa uh, which then uh, has the ovaries and testes, not the polyp, uh, not the uh, polyp phase. And <coughs> as you can see here, here is a colonial cnidarian that makes polyps. All right. So here is uh, this cnidarian is called Obelia. Uh, so it makes polyps, so that's a polyp, and some of these polyps are for feeding, but then some of these polyps will then produce a medusa, which then swims away, All right? So you can see a little one there, All right? So here is the, uh, what's called a gastrozoid, a feeding bud. So this is an individual, it's a polyp, but this is then a gonozoid, a breeding uh, bud, and from that gonozoid, a little medusa will then swim away from this colony. So Obelia is a colonial organism with lots of polyps living uh, together, um, but the breeding um, uh, polyps, the gonozoids, then uh, produce a medusa, which then can uh, swim away, uh, have sex. And so here you can see a medusa starting to leave. This is what the medusa of Obelia look like. This would be then produced from those, um, uh, those uh, gonozoids. Uh, uh, the medusa then produce ovaries and testes. Uh, sexual reproduction occurs. Uh, the embryo can then attach to a, um, uh, to a site and then start to make uh, those gastrozoids uh, again. Now, um, the cnidarians feed differently from sponges. Sponges are limited in what they can eat because the way that they ingest food is through phagocytosis. They can't eat anything bigger than the cell that is ingesting this. Whereas in the cnidarians and in metazoans in general, um, the, uh, these animals had evolved a gastrovascular cavity. Um, so see the space in the middle? So food can be brought here. All right, and then the food, I mean, let's say it's a small animal, a small fish, let's say. And now the, um, uh, uh, the fish uh, uh, can then be digested outside the body of, uh, outside the uh, cells. So while sponges lack this gastrovascular cavity, have to then digest inside cells after phagocytosis, all other animals can perform extracellular digestion by bringing food into a gastrovascular uh, cavity, right? Um, if you uh, then look at the gastrodermis, which lines the gastrovascular cavity, so they have a mouth, so there is the mouth that then opens into a gastrovascular cavity, and the cells lining it include cells uh, which make enzymes um, for digestion. The, the enzymes then go into the space so if there's a large animal, maybe a baby fish, uh, that's in that gastrovascular cavity, it gets digested outside the cells. So sponges can only digest inside sponge cells. Um, but uh, metazoans, you know, like you and I, and then also um, uh, these cnidarians, um, food is digested while inside this gastrovascular cavity because gland cells are releasing digestive enzymes which break down the food and then the cells of the gastrodermis can then absorb the nutrients. All right, so your stomach, your small intestine and the gastrovascular cavity of cnidarians, it digests large items uh, and breaks it down in this space so that uh, then um, the, uh, the nutrients can be absorbed. Now, um, something cnidarians have are these cnidocytes or nematocysts. These are fairly complex cells uh, which allow them to sting. So here's a little trigger. And if something you know, triggers uh, and, uh, this, uh, then this can be injected into the, um, uh, the prey. And so uh, cnidarians, like a jellyfish, can trap fish. So here you see those uh, nematocytes or cnidocytes here, these stinging um, uh, 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 cells, uh, which then allow them to paralyze prey, capture prey, that's so they can bring them into the mouth and the gastrovascular 
um, a, a cavity. Um, uh, and so uh, uh, cnidarians uh, are hunters. Uh, there are some exceptions with photosynthesis, which I'll talk about. Um, but they can sting and then capture, uh, capture prey. Not only can small cnidarians then uh, prey on fish by stinging them, etc., but there are larger cnidarians like uh, the Portuguese uh, man, uh, man of war. And uh, its long uh, tentacles uh, can sting fish, um, but also potentially fatal to uh, human swimmers and divers. And so uh, the you know combined um, uh, stinging of all of the cnidocytes uh, on these uh, tentacles uh, could actually paralyze um, uh, a human. Uh, and so. Uh, and cnidarians are capable of preying on uh, large, uh, more complex uh, animals using uh, these uh, stinging cells. Um, and here you can see, you know, part of the, the body is a gas bladder, which allows it to float so that the, the tentacles with the cnidocytes uh, then hang into uh, the water. Now, um, this hydra, this is a little microscopic organism or near microscopic uh, that you could even see uh, you know, in freshwater ponds or maybe even your swimming pool. Um, uh, now, uh, what uh, I had uh, done uh, here is um, if, uh, you know, when it is kind of in its uh, death throes, if you were to say add, you know, salt or an acid, um, what would then uh, happen is those stinging cells are then extruded. So if you look at its arms, notice that they'll look a little hairy are a little fuzzy at, at the end. And that's because um, uh, this cnidarian then just released all of those uh, stinging uh, cnidocytes, um, uh, which uh, normally uh, you know, would be used to, uh, to capture prey. And so if you've been stung by a jellyfish um, in uh, the water, it's because you brushed up against you know, one of the jellyfish's uh, tentacles and then those you know, stinging cells uh, then um, and then, uh, and then we're used. And so here you can see that on a small hydra, which would allow this hydra to say, uh, uh, you know, trap, you know, water insects uh, or, um, uh, or small fish, et cetera. Now, uh, a couple of, of additional uh, uh, topics. I'll be talking about corals in just uh, a little bit. Uh, one uh, thing is that uh, corals attract uh, algae to live inside them. Um, and so um, corals can be uh, fluorescent. Now, there's a slight difference between bioluminescent, which is what we see in cone jellies or tenophores, I'll be talking about those, um, something that is bioluminescent then uh, can uh, produce its own light, all right? So their metabolic reactions, they make um, uh, they then make chemical compounds uh, which produce light. So they're making their own light. And if you're living in the deep ocean, you know, that might help you attract fish on which you plan to feed. So there could be an advantage in that. Um, there's a difference between that and being fluorescent. Uh, fluorescent, uh, and I, I have this here because um, when I teach genetics, uh, you can actually introduce fluorescent jellyfish uh, protein into bacteria and the bacteria can glow um, a, a greenish a yellow because they're expressing a fluorescent protein uh, from uh, a jellyfish. Uh, so in addition to bioluminescence, there can also be fluorescence. And fluorescence involves taking one form of light that gets absorbed and then you release it as a different form of light. And a lot of corals are actually fluorescent um, because this is how they attract the endosymbiotic algae which live uh, then inside them. And so cnidarians and tenophores um, have uh, you know, these two types of light production. So the tenophore that you saw, that is bioluminescent producing its own light, while the jellyfish protein that you saw introduced into bacteria or these uh, corals which are trying to attract and their symbionts, they are fluorescent. They take light and then they release it as a different kind of, uh, of light. So that is a, um, 
uh, a feature uh, here. Um, just a couple of thoughts on uh, uh, on uh, fossil cnidarians. Um, fossil cnidarians first appear in the Ediacaran period. And although uh, cnidarians are important uh, today, um, cnidarians uh, were once the most diverse animals on Earth. They were um, uh, once uh, the uh, most common animals uh, on Earth uh, during this Ediacaran period. Now, one of the groups that uh, I still need to talk about are the corals, and it should be pointed out that uh, corals have varied throughout history, and in fact, reef organisms have varied throughout history. As I mentioned in uh, the previous uh, video, today sponges form parts of uh, reefs, and the very first uh, reefs were uh, composed primarily of sponges, including extinct uh, archaeocyathid uh, sponges. When uh, corals uh, first appeared in uh, the fossil record, they are not the corals which we have uh, today, the scleractinian corals. Um, there were extinct groups, the rugose corals, the tabulate corals. And so when corals first appear in the fossil record, it's not like you're looking at a modern uh, coral uh, reef, uh, but instead uh, the um, uh, a, a more primitive uh, uh, organisms. Now, um, the corals of the Paleozoic era, uh, like this tabulate coral, uh, each, you know, corals are colonial animals, so each one of these little spaces uh, would have had a little polyp uh, living in it. Um, they uh, uh, were, became extinct at the end of the Permian period. The Permian period was the worst period of mass extinction in the world. Um, there was a, a huge uh, uh, climate uh, a change uh, where uh, some vast uh, volcanic eruptions in Siberia, known as the Siberian Traps, would have caused the acidification of the oceans. And then if the oceans become too acid, uh, that if there's too much carbon dioxide there, then corals can't form their calcium uh, carbonate um, uh, cases in which uh, they uh, live. And so uh, this was a mass extinction not only of all marine uh, life at the end of the Permian 250 million years ago, um, but this is when the old groups of corals became uh, extinct. And then the um, it was in the Mesozoic era, in the age of dinosaurs, that the corals which we have uh, today uh, survive. And so, um, not only are there zero coral reefs in the Precambrian, um, but when there are coral reefs in the uh, Paleozoic era, starting in the Ordovician period, they're of corals which are no longer alive today. All right, and so in the Paleozoic era, coral reefs were important for marine uh, life, um, but these corals became extinct at the end of the uh, Permian uh, period. The Permian begins about 300 million years ago, ends 250. Um, uh, and at the mass extinction at the end of the Permian, and then it's only in the aftermath of the, uh, the, the Permian extinction that we get the uh, uh, the modern uh, corals, which are so important uh, uh, today. Um, now, uh, one can study this fairly easily um, because obviously the, the corals, they form uh, hard corallite around them, as I will mention, um, but this can then form limestone, right? And so um, uh, our uh, uh, fossil record of um, uh, of uh, corals is uh, pretty uh, good. So calcium carbonate, so carbonate plus calcium can form hard, stable uh, uh, structures, uh, which we could then split in, into different forms. Um, but there are a number of organisms that produce calcium carbonate. So for example, the sponges that I mentioned, some sponge spicules are calcium carbonate, um, some are uh, involve uh, silica. Uh, and when you look at the corals of uh, today, you see this hard uh, coralite, uh, which can then be preserved in uh, the fossil record as limestone. And so these are modern corals, which are different from the fossil corals. Um, so this is important for uh, lots of reasons. So here you can see limestone, and notice that the limestone 
was formed by these ancient coral animals. A little animal lived there, a little polyp. A little polyp lived there and there and there and there. So this was a colony. Uh, and not only does this make it easy to study um, you know, fossil uh, uh, corals and the like, but obviously if you were to say go to Florida, and you notice why is the dirt white? Why is the rock white? Because you know, much of Florida was once coral reef. So limestone, you know, forms the, the structures of many islands, um, uh, et cetera. And uh, so uh, the corals uh, are not only important uh, uh, today, uh, but uh, certainly uh, very important in the fossil era as, uh, as well. Um, and, and so I'm going to go back to uh, modern uh, forms as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the fossil forms of these are interesting. So there's a group called the comb jellies or the tenophores, and uh, their uh, fossils are also very old. Uh, and they, uh, while today they are uh, free living, uh, many of the uh, fossil uh, forms uh, were more stationary. So we have uh, fossils of the polyps of these um, at, uh, comb jellies or what have tentatively been uh, classified as comb jellies from the Ediacaran period and the, uh, the Cambrian uh, period here. Now I'd like to talk about two remaining uh, uh, groups, the uh, tenophores uh, or, that are known as the comb jellies, um, but then corals, I'd like to end with those. Now here's a jellyfish, all right? And tenophores or comb jellies um, were classified with cnidarians like jellyfish for a long time. Um, so here are these uh, tenophores, or these comb jellies. Um, then they were classified separately, and there has been you know, some discussion as to where in the family tree of the animals these comb jellies belong. How closely are they related to the uh, jellyfish. There's about 200 species of them. Uh, some of them are a couple millimeters, some are six feet. Uh, the majority of them swim freely, but some of them do have a polyp uh, phase, uh, which you know, attaches uh, to uh, the substrate. Uh, one of the interesting things about them, other than the bioluminescence, which I mentioned, um, is that they not only move using cilia, but they are the largest animals to do so. So they're carnivorous, like cnidarians. They have nerve cells and muscle, like cnidarians. Um, the muscle actually seems to be a bit more similar to that of, say, worms. And so that's why in their position of the, in the family tree of animals, they might actually be a little closer uh, to you know, the worm bilaterian group than, the, um, than regular jellyfish. And once again, they are the largest animals uh, to uh, move uh, uh, by uh, cilia uh, entirely. Uh, they produce sticky solutions, which then they, you know, can trap their um, uh, their uh, their prey with. Uh, so this is an uh, interesting uh, group. And uh, I, in this video, I just kind of summarize. Uh, there has been uh, uh, differences in, you know, analyses which uh, put them with the, you know, say jellyfish in the family tree of life with corals, um, but some uh, briefly, uh, some published, you know, these seem to be even more primitive than sponges. Now, other subsequent um, uh, studies uh, didn't uh, support uh, that uh, analysis. And some, such as the study of mussels, uh, put them as being a little more closely related to actual um, uh, worms and the like. They do have some more advanced features, one of them being that while uh, jellyfish uh, have a single opening to their gastrovascular cavity, so in other words, they, they don't have a separate anus, so the same opening serves as both the mouth and the anus in a jellyfish. Uh, um, the tenophores, um, some possess that uh, feature where only there's one opening to the a gastrovascular cavity, um, but some then have a uh, the second uh, a second opening as well. So they have anal uh, canals. Some of these might be transient, um, but this is more advanced than say the condition found in jellyfish. <coughs> uh, the last group I'd like to really focus on are uh, coral uh, reefs, and I have a whole playlist on uh, these because, to, the, to be honest, I don't think one could speak you know, say too much about coral reefs and their importance. Um, so 
Coral reefs don't compose a lot of the seafloor. The seafloor is enormous when you consider the size of the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the Atlantic, etc. Um, all coral reefs together would equal about the size of, say, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania. So New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, um, that's about the size of all coral reefs combined. That's not huge compared to the size of the ocean, but they are so incredibly important. So lots of islands, so here's the Florida Keys. Um, the soil underneath is white. It's built on an old coral reef. And coral reefs protect islands and uh, shorelines from storm surge. So, you know, the waves of storms, you know, they hit the coral reefs and then get less force, which helps protect the, um, uh, uh, the, the coast. Um, they are incredibly important for fish populations, which is the next video, but obviously fish are important for humans, for both food and for tourism. And so here you can see uh, in the Caribbean, a cruise ship uh, leaving, lots of these individuals are coming um, uh, for the fishing, for the scuba diving, uh, et cetera, that you can uh, do uh, uh, that is possible thanks to these coral uh, reefs. So coral reefs, really important uh, for um, uh, for humans, whether it be the protection of the actual structure of the, the islands and the coast, whether it be the protection of the islands and uh, coast, the fish populations, which you know, draw food and tourists and uh, the like. So corals certainly important for humans. Corals also very important for fish. Now, um, just to uh, offer a comparison, um, when we think about forests on land, forests are obviously important for animals because if you just have a big grassy plain, you don't find a lot of animals just in the middle of a grassy plain. You find more animals in a forest. There's like a three-dimensional structure where you can hide, where the young can be raised, um, etc. And in the same way, um, there's not a whole lot of fish life on the open ocean floor. So here you see a lot of fish life, but that's because this is a coral reef. All right. So um, uh, here, once again, here's a grassy plain, not a whole lot of terrestrial animal life here or here or here. And in the same way, if you were to just look at the open ocean floor, there's not a whole lot of life there. All right. Um, because when you look at these trees, this three-dimensional structure offers protection from the elements, places to hide, den sites, places where you can raise your offspring, um, uh, et cetera. And the same uh, uh, is true of coral reefs. If you look here, you see this great three-dimensional structure, uh, which then uh, is going to allow fish to hide, to raise their young, uh, et cetera. Um, now, in a forest, you have you know, the plants, all right, which are the, um, the producers at the base of the food chain. And then you can have herbivores which eat the plants, and then you know, carnivores can then eat the animals that eat the plants. Well, corals are animals, but they have algae living inside them. So the corals are actually doing photosynthesis. So most of their energy is coming from photosynthesis. So to a large extent, these animals are producers. And then you can have animals which eat the producers, like this fish, for example, um, is going to be eating the uh, coral. Now, not all fish uh, can do this, but some certainly can, um, as uh, you can see uh, here. Um, and so uh, then these fish are then herbivores, in a sense, eating the uh, producers of the, uh, the coral. And then just as the, now there are carnivores and terrestrial environments that eat the herbivores. Here you can see more fish which then can prey on uh, those uh, fish which eat uh, the corals. So because of the corals you have this more complex food chain which is uh, enabled. Um, just as you know a forest you know, gives you know, all of these nooks and crannies for dens and places to raise baby animals, the same is true um, to raise a young, um, to young fish. So see what, here you see all of these uh, tiny infant fish uh, growing here. Now I've been comparing coral reefs to forests, but that's not fair because some forests, the tropical forests, are where most uh, terrestrial biodiversity exists. And then the same is true of coral reefs. 
even though they don't make up the majority of the ocean floor, about a quarter of marine fish spend at least part of their life cycle in corals. Um, and so once again, even though coral reefs are not the majority of the sea floor, a quarter of uh, our uh, marine fish spend at least part of their life uh, there. And so coral reefs are the areas of the ocean floor where there is the greatest diversity of fish. Now just corals are cnidarians. So here you have a little polyp animal that um, in addition to photosynthesis, which I'll get to, can actually eat and trap uh, prey. So it has tentacles with stinging cnidocytes. Um, and so that it can catch little fish or catch aquatic invertebrates, bring it into the mouth, the pharynx, and the gastrovascular cavity where there it, uh, it digests its uh, prey. Now, this polyp makes a cup of calcium carbonate known as coralline. And then it's probably next to a neighbor doing the same, next to a neighbor doing the same. So when you look at a coral reef, you are looking at an immense coral uh, uh, colony which can go on for miles. And then you can actually even then have extensions known as a cenosarc, where this polyp can then you know, reproduce asexually and then produce a neighboring um, a polyp in the neighboring piece of, of coral. So think of an apartment building, all of these separate little houses all joined. So a coral reef can have lots of these cups, uh, cups of coral, like with lots of these little uh, coral animals uh, living uh, inside. Now, while corals can hunt animals and get energy uh, that way, um, the majority of their energy is actually gotten through photosynthesis. And so if you were to look in these tentacles, you would see dinoflagellates um, uh, primarily, but also perhaps a couple of other types of algae. So there um, are uh, photosynthetic organisms uh, here, which allow these corals then to produce uh, 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 sugar using sunlight. This is why coral reefs can't occur too deep in the water and why things like cloudy water will then uh, interfere uh, with uh, the uh, corals. They're producing photosynthesis. So you, you know, once again, you can't find coral reefs if you go too deep. They actually need light um, because of these dinoflagellates uh, living inside them as endosymbionts. The corals help to feed them um, and give them a place to live, but then these dinoflagellate algae, they produce uh, uh, energy using uh, sunlight uh, that the coral then benefits from. And typically then the majority of energy of the coral, maybe about 80%, is coming from uh, photosynthesis. Um, and so corals uh, in general live in nutrient poor water, but the fact that they can do photosynthesis and grow using sunlight then makes them uh, unique. So corals, incredibly important uh, for uh, humans, incredibly important for marine life. And that is why it is such a tragedy that human activity is having such a devastating impact on corals. Now that not only affects coral reefs, but obviously all of the marine life then that depends on them. So as humans put more and more carbon dioxide into the air as we burn fossil fuels, this is warming the planet and that will negatively affect corals. The warmer the oceans get, then uh, the worse corals uh, will do. And actually, um, if the, say the Caribbean, uh, if there's a heat uh, spell where the ocean uh, waters become warmer than usual for a bit, this can trigger bleaching. And in bleaching then, the, um, uh, the dinoflagellate endosymbionts then leave. It's called bleaching because these algae um, then give, can give the corals pigments. And then without these uh, pigments, uh, then uh, the corals look whiter and then they can die. Some corals can recover from bleaching, um, but many then just die afterwards and this is permanent.
Um, so warmer uh, water uh, will cause uh, bleaching. It also then decreases the rate at which they can make their calcium carbonate uh, cups. It increases the likelihood that they will become then uh, uh, get uh, diseases. Um, uh, the warmer waters affects uh, nutrient uh, stratification uh, throughout uh, the water column, which negative to, uh, negatively impacts uh, them as, uh, as well. So climate change warming water uh, is bad. Um, but that's not all, because if it's carbon dioxide, which is causing the water to warm, carbon dioxide can then dissolve in ocean water to become carbonic acid so that the oceans then acidify. Now you may remember uh, when I talked about the, um, uh, the fossils, uh, that it is thought that in the Permian period, the oceans became very acidic and that this wiped out essentially all coral reefs for a bit, all coral uh, reef building organisms became extinct. And so as we acidify ocean water, this is having lots of negative effects on corals, on their photosynthesis, on their survival, um, uh, et, et cetera. Um, but then there's more because human activity often adds more sediment to the water where there's more um, uh, erosion. Well, this makes the water cloudier and harder for photosynthesis. Uh, human activity also introduces sewage, uh, often from islands, because islands, they just don't have good soil that, you know, where you could put in a, um, you know, uh, you know a, a deep septic system. So there's a lot of flow into the ocean water, which is encourages microbial growth. The water gets cloudy, and now photosynthesis is harder. If sea levels rise, which they are with climate change, this then will um, make it harder for photosynthesis to occur because now the corals will be deeper and be getting less oxygen. Um, climate change will cause more severe storms to develop, which then can cause uh, the deaths of uh, coral um, uh, of coral reefs, um, and you know, and there's more. Some people fish using, uh, uh, not in uh, this country, but in some parts of the world, using dynamite or by using poisons, um, and so uh, this affects uh, coral uh, reefs. I made a, a song about it. If you're interested about the various um, uh, human activities which pose threats to coral reefs, but once again, the big picture is corals are so incredibly important for humans. Corals are so incredibly important for marine life. And human activity is really devastating uh, coral reefs uh, through so many um, multiple uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, you know, the uh, warming of uh, the waters, uh, the, um, uh, the acidification of, uh, uh, of the water, and so many others. So the people who uh, scuba dive and study corals and marine life will all attest that there is an alarming loss of corals. Look at this beautiful coral reef. Uh, you see all of the different forms of, of corals. You see the, the colors of the corals because once again, they have those dinoflagellate algal endosymbionts uh, living inside them. You know, so obviously this coral reef is vital for you know, uh, the marine life um, and, you know, the humans which then de depend on marine life. Once again, look at the, the diversity of the living corals uh, here. Once again, having that color um, because of those zooxanthellae, those endosymbiotic um, algae. But now look here at all of the white patches. So here are areas where the coral reef is undergoing bleaching, that a lot of the coral is dying um, and that this has been increasing at an alarming rate. So human activity and climate change are causing the bleaching of corals. And notice you just don't get the same diversity of, uh, of sea life. Uh, while some corals can recover from bleaching very often, once again, this causes uh, their, uh, their, uh, the death of uh, the corals. And so coral reefs are really being negatively impacted by uh, human uh, activity. And this is a major uh, eco uh, ecological uh, crisis uh, for uh, the world, both for marine life and for the humans, which depend so much on coral reefs and marine life.